So Saul, thank you for being here today. It's a pleasure. It's always <laughs> a pleasure coming to the headquarters of NARA. Thank you. Yeah, um, there's not as many people here on a typical day <laughs> because of COVID, but uh, you can still feel the vibe. We got a great vibe here. So Saul, um, as we were talking about a few minutes ago, I'm having a series of conversations with people, um, and and the thrust behind the conversations is really advancing the Latino economic agenda closing the Latino wealth gap in the United States. I personally believe that it's going to take a, a lot of things, a combination of things. I think it's probably going to take some government policy. It's going to take a lot of capital. Um, it's going to take more Latinos moving up the corporate ladder into the C-suites and boardrooms of America's largest co corporations. Um, and it's going to take some kick-ass entrepreneurs, in my view. And, you know, if people don't know who you are, um, indulge me for a second as I share with you or with the audience really your background um, and and you know I'll paraphrase a little bit but you were the very first US born Latino to be the CEO of a fortune 200 company when the, you were the CEO of US West Telecom uh, at a pretty young age you came up through the AT&T ladder um, you took control of one of the baby bells um, you had a successful tenure. You guided the company through a successful merger, um, made a lot of money for your shareholders, um, went on to do other things, startup, a few other things, then led another comparable size telecom corporation in Europe called Orange uh, out of Paris. And then after that led Telstra in Australia, the largest telecom in Australia, the largest employer in Australia, outside of the Australian government. Um, and you shared with me a lot of stories, uh, a lot of war stories. <laughs> uh, but I mean, I think it's also fair to say that you were able to accomplish that with, you know, basically being a maverick, you know, forging your own way. There was no latitude, and we're gonna talk about latitude in a few minutes. Uh, there was no LCDA, there was no LDC, there was none of these organizations or platforms that we have today that are all about advancing the Latino economic agenda, but you were able to do it anyways. So I first want to give you a chance to talk a little bit about your, your ascension through the corporate world. And then we'll talk a little bit about what your thoughts are on how we can advance that agenda, how we can close wealth gaps and so forth. And I want to finish by talking about latitude and why it's so important. Okay. Well, in answering your question, there was no latitude, LCDA, as you mentioned. But I did have really a virtual latitude, which was basically my parents. Mm. My father, his name was Trujillo, just like mine. And uh, they gifted me the last name that I had. Mm. And I grew up in a place called Cheyenne, Wyoming. Wow. Which there weren't a lot of people like us. <laughs> uh, but my father and my parents, they're rooted in the state of New Mexico, and our families have been around for 500 years. Here? So in in the, the United States, wow. centered around that area of New Mexico. And I always like to joke that when the Spaniards came, they landed in San Juan, they didn't find any gold, they went over to St. Augustine, didn't find any gold, and they went inland. Hmm. And they went to this area around the, the area of Santa Fe. Yes. Now, I took a few liberties there, but that's really what happened. And they started colonizing 100 years before the Mayflower. 100 years before the Mayflower. Yes. So when those people like talking about, you know, what is the native right and who is first and whose country is it and all that, I always like to start off any conversation about welcome to my country. <laughs> because in case anybody gets confused, this country is not named New Amsterdam, <laughs> to New London, New Germantown. It's named America. Hmm. Yes. And the founding fathers of this country, in terms of our Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and the people that were doing all that, they adopted that name as the name of this country that now exists for you know, hundreds of years and will list 
live on for maybe a millennium or two, hopefully, in terms of that founding. So my latitude was my parents, wow. who were very proud. And I grew up in a place that nobody was like me. But I was always competitor. I loved sports, and so I loved... Were your parents in the business world? Did they, no, they, no. Okay, no. My father never went to school. Wow. Uh, my mother went to about sixth, seventh grade, maybe. Um, but they had this dream for me. So you're uh, talking about values and yeah. work ethic and so forth. Yeah, and, and they struggled. I mean, they had tough jobs, and they worked all the time, and... And all of that. So I got to see that. And as I was growing up, I always looked at the kids that had things. The kids <laughs> that had nice clothes, that had cars, that had ultimately stuff. And I did the correlation of who are the ones that have the stuff and who are the ones that don't. I knew I didn't. But, I mean, I had love and I had this, this pride that I was brought, brought up with. But basically, that's what led me to go into business. Mm and get a degree in business because everybody that seemed to have stuff were people that were in business. So I majored in business, uh, went to the University of Wyoming, not Stanford, not Harvard. I didn't even know that they existed <laughs> uh, at that point in time. So, so I went there, got my degree, recruited, and uh, started the experience of, of, you know, what company am I going to work for? And I found out for the first time when I was being recruited from college, I was going to have my first airplane flight. <laughs> this is for a job interview. For a job interview, ah. flying to Phoenix, Arizona, leaving Laramie to go to Cheyenne, to go to Denver, and then fly to Phoenix. So I wasn't grow, you know, didn't grow up with a lot of perspective and. No summer parents, vacations in the Hamptons, not, nothing well, like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or parents sitting at the dinner table talking about the deficit or the, mm. you know, whether there's inflation or not or a recession or whatever. So, but, but I knew that I wanted to go out there and compete. <clears throat> and so when I started my career, I took my first job and it was basically a job of, in what they call the commercial department, knowing about customers, knowing about growth, figuring it out, forecasting it. What company was this? It was Mountain Bell Telephone Company. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Part of the old Bell system. And basically when I got into it, I started using stuff that I had learned in college that I used to sit there in class saying, how in the hell would anybody ever use mm -hmm. you know, this calculus, doing differential equations and things like that? And lo and behold, in my first job, I started looking at the work that I was doing and thinking about how there was well, a Well, that's good to hear. The so University of Wyoming, they, it was a good school. Well, it, was, it, it gave me the basics hmm. of what I needed. So I always think about everybody should have the basics, training of whatever it is that you do. And then you have to have, as somebody once said in a movie, the ganas. Hmm. You know, you have to have that desire mm -hmm. to do that. So I started my career. My first job... I did it. I started revolutionizing what, how the Bell system used to do it. And I started getting noticed. Mm. And noticed by, why, how did you think of that? Why did you, you know, like I shouldn't. And I was always sitting there saying, why would you ask me that question, right? I got it. I figured so you're making out. observations about the yeah. bigger picture of the business. Yeah, and that's really the key is, again, when you have ideas, you should always take your ideas and run with it. Mm. And be proven wrong because you're going to make sure that it's proven right. So that's the first, I would say, I don't know, idea, recommendation that you're having for people coming up the corporate ladder is that you shouldn't be afraid to articulate your ideas and insert them. That's how you get noticed, right. essentially. But I want to say one other thing that goes associated with it. Okay. I did not know protocol. Okay. Right? I, <laughs> you know, my family knew nothing about business. And so when I'm sitting in a meeting... I didn't think that you're supposed to wait till your superior talks and his or her <laughs> superior talks and all that. And the story I like to tell is I was in a meeting once upon a time, early in my career, my first year, and I was asked to present on some of the data and work I was doing, just informational for the senior executives of the company. And I presented. I think I did a good job. They, there weren't many questions. They thanked me. And the CEO asked me to sit in the back of the room in case there were any other questions later. So I'm sitting there, and they go on to some other topics and issues. 
And what happened was there was a big challenge at that point in time. It was during the high growth period hmm. uh, with the energy boom and keeping up. And, with, and what year is this? This is th this is 74, okay. 75. Okay. Yeah. And so basically they were talking about issues and coming up with solutions. And the average age of that group at that point in time, I was 21, 22. The average age of the group was probably 60. So I stood out in many different ways, but I'm watching them. Wow. And when they came up with the conclusion and everybody agreed with it, I was sitting there shaking my head. And the CEO looks over at me and he says, Saul, you're shaking your head. Does that mean you disagree with the decision that we just came to? And there was this moment of silence <laughs> in terms of my head and my heart and <laughs> everything else. And basically, I said, yeah, you got to tell him. So I said, yeah, I don't, I don't think it makes sense to me. And I said, but all of you know a lot more than me. And about this time, all these people, they were basically all Anglo males. And they were about 60. And those of us that are in that range, we all have reading glasses. Mm. And they all had their reading glasses. And I could see about 14 faces turned to me <laughs> all at once, like in unison, just like in a comic book. And so they looked at me like, what the hell are you doing? You're disagreeing mm. with us. Mm. And I'm looking at their faces, and then I'm looking over at the CEO, and I gave him my eye. He said, well, obviously, you don't agree. What would you do? And again, another decision point. Do I say what I think, or do I start backing away? Because I saw all these other mm -hmm. people looking at mm -hmm. me like mm -hmm. with vile with uh, <laughs> in their eyes. And so I said, you know, I recommended what I thought I, I, they should be doing. And he sat there and he started nodding his head. So then I'm feeling a little bit of relief at, at that point. And punchline is he said to me, Saul, thank you for your input. Thank you for the presentation. You're excused. And long story short, they went ahead with what I had recommended. Wow. And wow. I, got a, I got a call uh, from my boss's boss, boss after the meeting saying that, you know, the CEO, he really appreciated what I had to say because I had helped them move on to a different track. From there, I was noticed. But I, I also learned one thing. When people ask you for your opinion, give your opinion, mm. not what you think mm. others' opinions are or what you think consensus of everybody else is. Have belief, have faith in you. Now, I've always that's had That's interesting, that. and that's hard. That's hard for people. I mean, people, I mean, we're all sort of trained to to finesse things and to say things in a way that's not confrontational or offensive to anybody. Um, but you're saying that's fine, but you're not going to distinguish yourself as a potential leader if you're not willing to put yeah. yourself out there. Exactly. The other thing is, is I never thought about myself as different in the sense because I was Latino, because hmm. everybody else didn't look like me. But I didn't. How is that possible? How did you not notice that you were different? Well, I, I did notice that most <laughs> of the guys there had these buzz cuts, and they had the, you know, <laughs> they all wore gray suits, you know, uh, and with a blue tie, and uh, and all that sort of thing. But but it it didn't stop me. It, I didn't feel like I had to bow, and and all that sort of thing to people in terms of their opinion. But here's the you rest. knew you were different, but not different in a way that would limit you. Well, what, what it actually did, and I can only say this in retrospect, I wish I could say it, I knew it that yeah, minute. at that moment. Is that I was as smart or as insightful as anybody in that room. And you knew it at that age? Yeah, well, and, and it was by luck, I mean. Were you, or was that just a state of mind that you had? No, 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 it, uh, it, when, the bo when I heard that the boss had changed the, the decision to what I had recommended. That gave I you the. I sat there saying, the yeah, I got a little bit of confidence there. That, But you yeah, obviously didn't have the experience that a lot of those guys had. No, but I had been out. I, I, I'm a student. I'm a forever student. Mm. I still read. And I know much. that about you to this day. I read a lot. I, I always wanted to be as more prepared than anybody. But the next thing that I did then, and this is the rest of the story about my career, is that I then went 
after my first year, I was at, sent, brought in for an appraisal, which you do in corporations. You sit down with your boss, and they fill out a chart on you and all that kind of the stuff. The 360 review or whatever they yeah, call it now. Well, it's, it's a 360, <laughs> you get bigger in the company. Okay, okay. But when you're a starter, you know, a rookie, they don't make that kind of investment yet. But he was giving me feedback about all the things that I did well and all that kind of stuff. And he said, so let's talk about how you think about your career. Hmm. Now, this is year one of my career. And I said, well, I want to be CEO. So you knew year one of your career that your goal was to be CEO. Oh. Yeah. Because of that one meeting that I was in, <laughs> and I saw that I could think, given my level of experience, as well as these other people. So it's the confianza, you know, mm -hmm. it's the confidence mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that you can have that you build for yourself. It's not because other people give you, you know, any kind of praise. It's you have to, if you know that you can prepare and you can compete, it's like sports, right? Uh, yep. You know, when, when Steph Curry was a little kid and he's dribbling the balls and practicing shooting you know his in his mind he was already envisioning that he was going to be a pro player yeah now some people might say well he's saying that because his dad played well some of us we didn't have parents that that played the game but uh, i think we we live through life and we see different examples and this is why role modeling is important it may be somebody and i was thinking that i was also thinking that that ceo must have been a pretty amazing guy yeah first of all to to let you in the room in the first place, and second of all, actually listen to what you had to say and act on it. I yeah. mean, that seems like something that doesn't happen a whole lot. No, 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 and that, that you're, you're exactly right. That's why I said the meeting itself was luck. Hmm. But then the question is, is, okay, so when you're presented with that situation, do you step up or do you step hmm. back? Hmm. Do you hesitate? Again, going back to sports, those who hesitate when they have the great passing opportunity or shot opportunity or whatever it might mm. be you, you know you you can't you can't wait so there are these moments where your decision at that moment can define the future that you have from a career standpoint or even yeah. from a personal standpoint and that's what i always like to the, the young people that i mentor and they ask me for advice is i always say be true to yourself mm. be respect yourself if you don't respect yourself and your capabilities how would anybody else, right? So, so you take that. Then you start thinking in a, in a career sense, there was nobody like me, right? So I started thinking, gee, I want to be CEO one day. But I knew I had to do my own career pathing because I knew from the feedback I'd been getting and all that, people were going to slap me in the ways that they th thought I should go. And, and, and you also told me at one point that your heroes during that time weren't athletes and entertainers. It was the Lee Iacocas and the the Welsh GEs, Jack Welsh, famous Jack yeah. Welsh, and people like that. Yeah, I would say Iacocca, who has written a book, and at that time, then Jack Welch, and then uh, Lou Gerstner, who had IBM. transformed IBM. Mm. And so I literally started my career thinking about, so how am I gonna develop myself? And I would pay out of my own pocket to go hear Jack Welch speak to speak at things that he was doing. I'd pay out of my own pocket to go hear Lou Gerstner hmm. and, and others because I was always saying, I'm going to study those who are great leaders and learn from them and embed what I feel makes sense. And I'm also going to study the leaders that don't have great reputations. Really? Interesting. Because I want to learn from them. Wow in terms of what turns people off or what keeps them from being successful. You don't hear that very often. People recommending that you also study people who failed yeah. um, or that were not great leaders to really try to extract what to avoid. Yeah, and that's exactly right. And I've always done that with customers because hmm. everybody likes to get feedback from customers and when it's good feedback, they want to hear it. They want more. And when there's bad feedback or no feedback, then they- They want to dismiss it. Yeah. And I, I'm a guy that says, I'm going to get better listening to the bad feedback than I am the good feedback. Mm, okay. And so, That's tough, though. That's tough for people to, to, to have that disposition, that mindset, and be willing to, to reflect on yourself to that degree. Yeah. And so 
so the the rest of the story for my career and i'll just stop on that is that i was a as a competitor i started seeing early in my career that the people that were named smith jones steinberg whatever they were rising faster than i was i mean let's just put it out there so you're talking about jewish uh business leaders anglo you know yeah, whatever uh -huh. that they were getting promoted part of it was because they might have gone to a Harvard or a Stanford or... So they had the pedigree. Or, yeah, or, you know, one of the British uh, Oxford schools, or Oxford whatever, yeah. and all that. London School of Economics. And, uh, and I found that, you know, maybe there's something here that I need to take control of. Hmm. Not be a victim of, but to take control of. So when I would take a job, I would sit down with my boss, my new boss, and say, what's the best job that's ever been done in this job? And everybody quickly tells you about Joe or Betty or somebody that did a great job. And then they quantify it in terms of the kind of results. And then I'd sit down with them and say, so what would you think if I took that set of results and doubled it? Hmm. <laughs> and you and I would agree that those were my targets. They'd always say, first of all, are you sure? And then secondly, if you did that, you'd be, you know, you, you're going to be on the rise. So performance, you delivered. Yeah. You hit numbers and then some. Well, well, it was more than that. I set targets that were way beyond anything that anybody thought would be the targets you should set. And I've done this my whole career, including as CEO. Well, I've seen it firsthand. And so, so I, wanted, I, I wanted people to not have an excuse hmm. when you want to be the CEO ultimately that they can't say, well, but, you know, all that kind of stuff. And so you always outperform what anybody thought was possible. And then you have the conversation, and then pretty soon you're there. Mm -hmm. so, so that's how I was able to take on jobs. I was able to get moved to go fix whatever was broken in the company that I worked at. And finally, the company reached the point when I was a senior executive, the company really got in trouble. And I was not the favorite person of my boss at the time. Uh, every company has their succession planning. And I was viewed as high potential, but I wasn't the favorite because I was a maverick. Mm -hmm. I always questioned why we were doing things that I didn't think made sense. And I'd go off and do things to get the, yep. the kind of results. And so you're labeled as a maverick. And I used to take that as a, as a badge of honor mm -hmm. as opposed to Gee, he goes and plays golf every weekend with the boss. He parts his hair on the side and he wears wingtips and, you know, all that kind of stuff, which was, you know, th that wasn't my thing. I was going to I was gonna get to the top doing it, you know, the old Frank Sinatra song, My, my Way. way. <laughs> and I wasn't going to bow to politics. I wasn't going to bow to tradition. I was going to bow to my customers, to the shareholders and others in terms of performance and the people that work for you. And so ultimately I got picked, not by my CEO when my CEO was asked to step down from his job because he recommended some other people, but I was picked by the board hmm. who had watched me through my career, taking on different parts of the- How old were you? I was then 40, 41. 41 years old. Yeah, and became the CEO at 42. And uh, this, so, so my, the, the reason why I like to point that out is, you know, sometimes if you're waiting for other people to make you known, if you're waiting for other people to bless you, if you're waiting for other people to sanction you, that's not the way to control your so, career. So that's a great opportunity to pivot a little bit here, which is my next question which is why, why aren't there more Latinos who've made it to the top of major corporations in this country, who've made it to the sweet suites, uh, C-suites of these companies, uh, the boardrooms and so forth? Is it because they're waiting to be sort of ordained? Uh, is it because they don't perform the way you performed? Um, is it because they don't know the right people? Tell me, because the numbers are shockingly yeah. poor. We don't have a single Latina CEO in America of a major corporation. Uh, we only have a handful of Latinos and most of them are foreign born and not US born. Um, 
we have what I don't know what the percentage is, but it's what less than five percent of the board seats um, in Fortune 500 companies. So those are pretty yep. distressing numbers. I mean, there's probably a lot of reasons why. Tell me why you think those numbers are what they are. Well, I need to be fair to the people that come from Spain or Argentina or mm -hmm. other places that are, you know, they're Latinos, but they weren't, they didn't grow up in the United States. They grew up in a country where the president of the country, the Was, heads of every like major, major company looked like them, had uh -huh. the same last name, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. So they grew up with a sense of... They can do anything. Yeah. And, and they're no different. Mm-hmm. In the United States, when you grow up as a Latino, there's always things, you know, we see it, you know, discriminatory kinds of things. We see, you know, anything on TV is, oh, if you're a Latino, you're always a, a gangbanger, drug dealer, yeah, true. you know, you're not the person about that, the media a lot, but yes. that, that leads the way. And when they cover the news, you know, uh, you, anybody can watch their evening news and see what they cover. So the perception of Latinos is already influenced for those who are making decisions and they're always looking for that one example that one experience where they don't perform quite like everybody else and therefore they get labeled they get cast in in a in a you know a certain way but that's not an excuse mm. my personal view is no you take control of your own brand you think about your own brand. First of all, it's got to have this element of performance. And I mean, not just same as. I mean, during my time as the only one, I had to be 10 times better, not two times better. <laughs> but I, I didn't take that as an excuse. And I want people to understand, look, life is not fair. Sometimes these things happen, and we can all argue that it shouldn't be that way. But make it that way so that you're front-footed. When I lived in Australia, they always used the phrase, are you on the front foot or are you on the back foot, mm. right? And I'm a believer of being front footed, and that's what so I encourage people. You're talking about being about. assertive and yeah. being yeah. proactive yeah. and not reactive. Yeah, and, and you know having a platform from which to be assertive, which is performance. In every company, it's all, it should always be about performance. And then secondly, it's about how you prepare yourself. Mm. I've never been into a meeting where I didn't want to be more well prepared than anybody there. And I didn't care who it was, what part of the world it was. I didn't want to be caught short by anybody for anything. Because then what happens is when people know not only are you a performer, but you're also always prepared. Your brand is built and communicated and talked about by others. And so in today's world, I mean, even now where I'm not running a big public company, I mean, you've seen the kind of influence you can have based upon your brand. Your not, personal brand. Yeah. And, and everybody should think about their careers that way. So why not? We, we as a cohort now need to start thinking about how do I be front-footed? How do I push my agenda? And how do I allow myself to be differentiated based upon what I'm doing? not because of a perception or you're not going to be accepted or you don't have the right pedigree or the right background. Because I can tell you in the time frame that I went through the AT&T Bell System era, they had assessment programs where they would bring people in what they thought were high potential people. And ultimately there was one for seat, you know, people that could become officers. I went into that and there were people from all the name schools around the world and we stood in a line and everybody had to introduce themselves. 20 people. This sounds like a military, but yeah. it was run 20, in a similar way. Yeah, 20 people in a room and you were there for a week to be assessed. <laughs> and you were given IQ tests, you're given in-basket tests, you're given team tests, who emerges as leaders, et cetera, et cetera. And the first day, this is where I noticed the pedigree mattered, at least for some. You stand in line and you're introducing yourself. My, my name is Trujillo, so I'm at the back end. So all the A's and then the B's and the C's. And everybody there was, you know, from all the name schools around the world. 
And then when it came to me, I was the second to the last, and I still see the picture that night. And when I said, well, you know, my name is Solomon Trujillo, uh, I grew up in Wyoming, went to the University of Wyoming. Snickers. <laughs> laughter. You heard it? Laughter <laughs> from these people that thought they had a pedigree mm -hmm. that was better than me. And I sat there, and I looked around the room, and I paused. And I made everybody uncomfortable because of their snickering hmm. and things like that. And pretty soon, people are looking at each other. Wow. And it set the tone for me for that week. And it wasn't because I planned it. It's because I reacted to it. And I was going to be front-footed. And I wasn't going to take a backseat to somebody that think, thought that they had a better background than me and therefore would be assessed through a process. And as it turned out, you know, I was one of the two or three that went through and So, so what I hear you saying, Sol, is that some of it is on us. Some of it is on us. Um, there's no replacing performance, just like in sports. You got to be able to deliver on the court on the field you got to be able to deliver you got to hit your numbers you got to perform number one the other thing is you know you you mentioned a little bit about the people who traditionally made it up the rat ladder and still do to this day um, and I have a belief that you know people tend to hire people they know or people who they're comfortable with right which is code for people who look like them and you know come from similar backgrounds and not all of that is like overt racism it's just human nature to a certain degree i think that there are communities like the jewish community that have been proactive in dropping the ladder and making and creating opportunities for folks from their community to have successful careers and to you know rise up the corporate ladder and to run big you know private equity firms and so forth we don't do that yeah. very well as Latinos. I mean, is that true? Is that a fair assessment? Yeah. I, I like your analogy because I, I often talk about the Jewish community. Hmm. And a lot of people sometimes say, well, Saul, you, you shouldn't be anti-Semitic. Or are you being <laughs> anti-Semitic? And the answer is I, no. I'm not. Yeah. No, because the, Jew, the Jewish community, the Jews that came here in the, and were experiencing life here in the United States in the 20s and 30s, they had huge discrimination issues. They had all kinds of problems. So what did they do? Did they take out the violin and start playing the violin and <laughs> saying, what was us? No, they, they banded together. Hmm. Yes. And they started building businesses. They started investing in each other. They started doing business with each other. And pretty soon they started blossoming in a very disproportionate way. But they stayed connected and intertwined in so many ways. The financial industry the retail industry, the entertainment industry, and we can go on and yep. on. So, so when I talk about it, I talk about it in a way that's very respectful. We have a second example, which is the Miami Cuban uh, cohort, the first wave, the they first generation. They are a cohort, but yes. But the first generation that came over, they came over, they were in a foreign land, they left, escaped from another land that was their homeland, and they banded together. Hmm. And so when you go to Miami and you see the power of the, the, the mayor, Cuban cohort, right? The, the companies and so you, forth, yeah. You, you see that effect of what happens when people do that. Hmm. Now, in terms of your point, the Latino community now needs to do that in total. Is Not this a new discipline? Is this How hard is it going to be to change those, those disciplines? Well, to me, it should be a natural act, Yeah. right? Because... The way I like to explain it to people, whether you're Anglo or Latino or anybody else, is if you're a Garcia in Miami or a Garcia in New Jersey or New York or a Garcia in Los Angeles or a Garcia in San Antonio, guess what? Everybody thinks we're all the same. So don't think of yourself just as Cuban or just as Puerto Rican or just as Mexican or just, you know, whatever. We're all Latinos. And we're Americans, those of us that are citizens here and all of that. And we own as much of this country as anybody else. And the opportunities to collaborate are huge. 
because this is the growth so cohort. Latinos need to collaborate regardless of national origin we yeah need to, I mean those are artificial to me, barriers to me that's kind of silly I yeah. mean okay. it's not yeah. relevant in today's world and so we we now have a unique responsibility the way I look at it and the way we you and I have talked about creating latitude is that we have a unique responsibility to our country we are the reason why the US economy will be able to compete for the next three or four decades because we're youthful because we're entrepreneurial because we're educated because all the things that that the, are needed yeah that yep. were historic they were part of our DNA as a country. And this and is why we should be front-footed. This exactly. should give us a bounce on our step because we are the drivers of economic growth in this country now and for the foreseeable future. Exactly. And so that's why, you know, when you look at our team of Latitude and partners, you know, there's you and I who came together. We grew up differently. We came from different perspectives, different industries, et cetera, but we found an affinity. And then Emilio Estefan, who's mm -hmm. Cuban, but you know he's a he was a Cuban immigrant. Um, he saw the power of this, in terms of saying this is the way we all should be thinking, you know, across the Latino cohort, but not just to separate Latinos, but to help Latinos uh, help others understand that they need to be joining into this catalyst cohort of the United States of America. You were in the room, I think, when Steve Forbes. Yeah, I was, yep. When he was talking about the Latino cohort. That was in LA, yep. He, he and I had had two conversations about the data. He was very skeptical at the beginning. But he ultimately, when he saw the data, so he's a smart person that likes numbers. When he saw the data, you heard the quote which said, you know, everybody in this country should understand that Hispanics, he didn't use the term Latino, Hispanics are like the cavalry already coming over the hill to save our economy. Yeah. And he that's the that. way every American should be thinking. And underneath that, every Latino, Latina should be thinking that and understanding we have a great responsibility. And that I don't I don't and, look at it as as gee, you need to understand this, folks. No, no, no. We have a responsibility because if we are we front have to footed, talk about that. You're saying well, more than talk about it, we need to continue to build these businesses. And we so need to continue to build our careers. We're the we Calvary because we're growing faster than the overall population, both economically and in terms of population growth, household formations. We're younger than the general population by a long shot. We have a really strong work ethic as a community. <clears throat> We're the largest, we have the highest workforce percentage rate of any other demographic. And as you and I know, and have talked about many times, we're forming new businesses at a faster rate than the overall population by a long shot. We're purchasing new homes at a faster rate than the overall population by a long shot. These are data points that people who should know, like Steve Forbes, like CEOs of major corporations, but for whatever reason, they don't know. Yeah. And we need to change that, obviously. Yeah, and that's why, you know, at Latitude, we periodically have CMOs come in. Chief marketing officers. Chief marketing officers come in to be our benchmarks. Because I'm a, I'm a zealot as a CEO. I'm a zealot about segmenting customer bases. And I've had to transform four different companies, three big publicly traded companies. And each time I look at segmenting my customer base, hmm. seeing who's growing, who's not growing, who's in decline, all that sort of thing. And then I try to allocate resources to growth and where my biggest base is. And then you maintain an every, every other kind of cohort. And this is just good business. So if you think about the economy in the same way, you know, you can look back at Ronald Reagan. And Ronald Reagan was the one president that said, hey, we got a lot of people here that have been working. They're good, hardworking people. We should allow them to become citizens, right? Yep. Now, some people like to negatively portray it as, well, that's amnesty, and why didn't... And the answer is because they were here working, creating productivity in our economic cycles, filling jobs, doing all kinds we of things. We needed them. E exactly. So we wouldn't have had it. And by the way, and you've seen this before, but I'd like to say it continuously. 
we have two presidents in modern era that, that had the highest GDP growth rates. Ronald Reagan, for eight years, his average GDP was over 3.5%. Bill Clinton, who followed him, also had growth rates of GDP over that. And when you do the diagnosis, which I'm a data guy, you do the diagnosis, you see the one predictable, pre common variable that allows you to predict whether you're going to grow or not is labor force growth rate. Hmm. And labor force growth rate, you can see during those 16 years, was at the highest rates we've, we've had. Then increasing <coughs> the number of workers in our economy. Yes. And also supplemented by immigrants that came in and helped us grow even more because our GDP is a function of number of workers times output of goods and services. And then how much they consume and some of the productivity kind of variables. So, so we, we were growing. So guess what we're at now? We're at almost zero labor force growth rate. Which now, is why we have, what, 10 million unfilled jobs? 10 and a half million unfilled jobs, according to last month's data. It's probably growing. But we have the comparables of countries that didn't allow for immigration. Japan. Hmm. They've been in stagflation for 20 years now. Yep. Because they want it to be hom yep. homogeneous. Mm -hmm. We have Europe, which has now aged. And they, years back, didn't really favor a lot of immigration and they're stagnating and so they have very low GDP growth rates and actually more recently negative GDP growth rates and then you have India over there that's growing very fast they have a youthful cohort they're growing their labor force every year and they're becoming more productive and they're able to start creating new businesses investing in technologies etc so, so this is really the role that we play as Latinos in this country. We are the cavalry coming over the hill. We all need to be front-footed in terms of thinking about the role I can play in my own career or starting my own business or taking on whatever my company is looking to do in, in you know, growing their business. And that's where now I want to see, and I'm working this personally, with CEOs on some of the Latinas on boards and Latinos, but Latinos are the most underserved, underengaged cohort we have in this country, mm. of all cohorts. Mm. And so we need to work on that. But that's where you think about front footedness, where you think about the strategies, where you think about what we can do. And I think that's a good lead into. Well, let's talk about a couple of things entrepreneurship. Latitude Ventures, right? So I have this thesis that entrepreneurship might have the best ability to close wealth gaps, to advance our economic agenda. Um, and the reason I think so is that there's the opportunity for what I call multiplier effects. And, and, and my thought around that is that when a Latino-led startup or company is successful and achieves scale, not successful in a modest way, but actually achieves scale, a number of things happen. Number one, it's great for the founders and for the investors and for the employees of that company. And hopefully they, they, they make a little bit of wealth and they pass that on. But secondly, it also attracts more investment into the community. Because those companies, when they achieve scale, they start to, first of all, validate the market. And in some cases, take market share from other larger competitors who respond by okay, we, this is no longer just a, a nice thing to do or something we should do. And I'm talking about hiring more Latinos and having a strategy to reach that market effectively. This is something that if we don't do, we're gonna to continue to lose market share and we're probably gonna lose our jobs, right? That's a whole different conversation that occurs. And I think only entrepreneurship can actually make that happen. You were very um, clear from the very beginning when we started Latitude that one of the primary components of the event itself needed to address the access to capital scenario that we were seeing. Less than 1% of venture capital was going to Latino-led startups, the last I heard. I mean, think about that. We're 18% of the population, we're 23% of the millennial population, and we get 1% of the venture capital. I mean, that's 
astonishing. Not, not only venture capital, private equity. Capital. Private equity capital. So uh, so trillions of dollars. Yeah. And less than one percent. Less going than one percent. The, the cohort. So so your your premise is right. That's why we've created Latitude Ventures, with the premise that says, we know we can generate great returns. But we also want them to be creating jobs, right? And we want them to be creating wealth, not only for founders, but for the people that are working in those founders. So companies. this is our opportunity to create new disciplines. Yeah. We talk about dropping that ladder. We look at companies and we want to invest in companies that have a great prospect or perspective for growth and success. But we also look and see who do they hire? Who are the owners of that company? Who are the senior managers? And we invest in companies that align with our vision in that regard. And I've seen you firsthand get an opportunity to mentor these leaders and tell them why these things are important. And maybe that's something that's never occurred before, but I think the upside is tremendous. Yeah, and I think the, the other thing is just this notion that you touched on, which is the wealth. The United States of America right now is just above Saudi Arabia in terms of the OECD, the Organization of Economic States, whatever the acronym is. But there's a study done every year about the concentration of wealth by country hmm. or the disbursement of wealth hmm. in, in countries. And so we're just above Saudi Arabia now. We used to be in the top 20 or 30 countries. We've always had wealthy people, you know, the Rockefellers and, you know, all that sort of thing. But now we have really fallen behind most countries. <clears throat> Think about that. So most of the wealth is concentrated to a smaller well, population. Is depending what upon who studies, you could argue that today 38 people in this country have about 93% of, they control 93% of the assets in this country. Think about that, 38 people. No, that's now, not. that's why we're standing over there close. And I would take, I would guess <clears throat> that none of those 38 people are Latino. <laughs> no, no. Uh, but that's why we're standing over there by Saudi Arabia in these rankings because, you know, they have a royalty system, right? It's a monarchy. <laughs> yeah. or, and, and, and you would expect that. But here in the United States, we think about a capitalist system, which everybody competes. And if rewards capital is available. Rewards. So what's happened is, <clears throat> and this is the argument that I make, is that 21st century America is different than 20th century America. And so we need to understand the new rules. How so? There's what I call the two Ds. The digitization of everything has changed the old business rules and how things work and how we all consume and how we look and how we buy and how we do everything. The second D is demographics. <laughs> and so if you look at pre-depression back in the 20s, you would see that there was a concentration of wealth in some family named Rockefeller, mm -hmm. some family named Carnegie, mm -hmm. some family named Vanderbilt, some... And they not only controlled well, they controlled the industries. Yep. And guess what happened? Ultimately, the economy toppled over mm. because the masses weren't participating. Participating, And so now we have that same sort of issue where you look at the, the, the Dow, you can look at the Standard & Poor's indices, uh, even NASDAQ, it's controlled basically by eight to 12 companies. That's it. And there's really four or five that really make the biggest difference. It's a thing, but, companies. But, but the point is, is that that can that is what it is but it, it doesn't have to be what could be and that's where latitude ventures we you know we came up with the idea and said we're going to invest in latino latinas who are the most prolific entrepreneurial cohort that we also understand they're good at starting they're good at growing but then when they need the capital to grow into being big they can't get access to the capital that's needed and that's equity capital. Now, debt capital is important, and everybody likes to talk about debt capital, and the bank should be doing this or that. The real problem has been equity capital, and you quoted the statistic. Less than 1% of all VC, PE, invested capital went to this cohort, who's creating more companies than anybody else. What you described once is one of the greatest mysteries in the history of capitalism. Yeah. Because capital is supposed to flow where growth is. And if the growth is in this cohort, why is not the capital flowing? And that's why we have the session of latitude, because I like talking to CEOs. Because one of the privileges I have 
is that I've run big companies. Yep. And I've run big companies all over the world. So nobody can look at me and say, Saul, you don't understand. You've never run a big company and you know we have all this. Oh, 100%. And, and so I'm challenging people to start thinking about our country's future, to think about how are we going to compete if we're not flowing capital to where the growth is. I'm just going to interject something here, Saul, and I think it's important, and that is, um, you know, I've been part of the what I call the Latino advocacy community for 20 years now, and I've always felt myself to be a bit of a maverick in that space as well, because I don't come from the civil rights community. I don't think of things from a social policy standpoint. For whatever reason, I looked at it from an economic standpoint, and that we have to make an economic case. And it's an easy case to make, frankly, but nobody was really making it, right? And I think that sometimes the civil rights community that I give a lot of credit for doing so many things that open doors for a lot of people also has an unintended consequence attached to it. And that is when you are always talking about people with immigration problems, when you're always talking about people with economic problems, when you're always talking about discrimination, you actually help create a perception that we are a community that's rife with problems. It's not intentional, but if those are the primary spokespeople for a community, that's the perception that people get. And why would anybody want to invest capital in a community that is rife with problems? We've never had a Sol Trujillo really being an advocate for the Latino agenda, the way you've become that in the last few years. And you take an entirely different approach. You have run big companies, so it gives you a different level of both access and credibility when you talk about certain things. This is a this is a tipping point, I think, for the Latino community. We owe a lot to you for that. Let me just say that first. You, when you and I discuss creating Latitude Ventures, you know, you said we're going to raise a hundred million dollars, <laughs> and I thought, okay, <laughs> let's let's go for it. And you know, you pick up the phone and you call CEOs and you make that case and you say, are you in for ten? Are you in for 15 or do you really want to play? And do you really get what this opportunity is really all about? And, um, you know, lo and behold, we were able to hit that goal of $100 million. And that's only phase one, I think, uh, in your opinion, in our opinion. So, so first of all, I just want people to understand the context of that. I want them to understand that this, this is something different that's happening right now. And, you know, I'm proud to say that part of the reason Latitude Ventures exists is because Latitude exists. And that's, you know, uh, the, a byproduct of a conversation that you and I started about six years ago, which is we needed a platform that did all the things that we've talked about here today, that made connections, that educated the uh, resource allocators, as you put it, which are CEOs and people who set public policy and so forth, um, that creates a marketplace where those relationships can actually be, uh, can actually be transitioned into actual deals and where businesses actually get their funding, where film projects get greenlit. Um, and those platforms, for whatever reason, have escaped us in the past. So I want to end this conversation by talking about latitude, why latitude so important, and what the ultimate vision is for that. Well, that's, that's a great ending because it's really the beginning yeah. of the narrative in this country about the Latino cohort. I like to think about latitude when I have people that know nothing about it. I had somebody ask me this past week. So what is latitude? So I've heard about it, but tell me what it is. I said to him, it's a chance for you to see the Latino family photo. <laughs> he said, family photo. <laughs> and I said, yeah, because you can come and see the Latino cohort in a very factual way, a very real way, but you're gonna see the dynamism of the people that are there in the entertainment industry, in the, in the business, in the corporate world, in the entrepreneurial world, and whatever, and you can feel the velocity of what's happening with the Latinas or Latinos in the Latino cohort that are playing in all sectors. They're not over here in East LA or in South Miami they're all over and they're creating 2.8 trillion dollars of GDP making it equivalent to France and the UK or not the UK but to France 
And when you come to Latitude this year at the opening, everybody's going to have a chance to see the new Latino Donor Collaborative GDP report, mm. which is going to have, as they would say in Australia, some gobsmacking data. <laughs> but, Gary, you know, for me, Latitude, when you and I came together, was this is our opportunity to, to create this platform, this stage, for everybody to see our family and how important it is to the rest of the community. And the community being all Americans. Because we work together, we invest together, sometimes we compete against each other, and we serve in our military very patriotically mm. at a very disproportionate rate. Yeah. We're, we're creating jobs in a disproportionate fashion creating companies in a disproportionate fashion, supplying 80% of all net new workers to this country's economy. And so there's so much there that people, right before their eyes, weren't able to see until we create the showcase, until we create the stage, and until we create the opportunities for collaboration that you talked about, whether they be collaborating amongst groups whether they be collaborating with companies or whether they be collaborating on deals and yep. other yep. things that can happen. And that's the beauty of latitude. So it's an American agenda. It's a Latino agenda. It's a business agenda. And it's also fun, thanks to Gary Acosta, because he's always reminding me, Saul, we got to have that element of fun here because we want people to, exp and I'm speaking as Gary now, we got to have this element of our culture uh, embedded and we woven because our culture is unique we're very respectful we know how to enjoy our language our music and the faith elements and the family elements and all the elements that are really somewhat unique to the cohort but not threatening to other cohorts it's one that m creates comfort and that's the idea, comfort around the economy and the contributions, comfort around actually being givers instead of takers, yep. and comfort as neighbors, as co-workers, co-investors, and maybe sometimes as competitors. <laughs> well, I think that, you know, that sums it up pretty well. And I've, I'll just add to that sort of picture, uh, the phrase that you referred to and have coined from the very beginning, which is, this is the new mainstream economy in this country. And when you talk about culture, we're not replacing anybody. This is an evolution of American culture, which has been evolving now for 250 years plus. Um, and so that's great. Uh, the Latitude platform, the event is this September. Uh, we have a world-class lineup. Um, it's another can't miss event for anybody who is aspirational, as we describe, whether it's somebody who wants to get all the way to the C-suite of their corporation or some ambitious young entrepreneur that has a great idea and is looking for contacts, capital, and relationships and maybe mentors as well. Um, and, you know, it's going to be a lot of fun. So, Saul, thank you so much. Thank all right. you for this conversation. My pleasure. For your friendship and for all you do, you know, for all of us. Thank you. It's been great. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. Uh, a couple of things. <clears throat> Gary, you always get a good reaction when you explain to the guests the name of the podcast. Yeah, I mean, but I'm gonna, I can do that later. Yeah. Or right now. Okay. To right. get his react, to get Saul's reaction. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, okay, that's good. And I went over to lose right too. And then um, give us specific what's two years Latitude looks like. Incorporate everything. Because I think people want to follow the journey and they're a part of it. And you put big numbers, corporations will be like, holy shit, we got to be there. If you want to, because. Yeah. Just those two questions and we're good. Yeah. So, so, um, so first of all, Saul, thank you for being part of this podcast. Uh, it has kind of a, you know, a fun name associated <laughs> with it. Um, I try to be provocative. I try to be a little bit interesting, but it also, I think, embodies what I think is necessary for us to be able to close those wealth gaps and advance the Latino economic agenda. So I, I call it, um, I call it gubbies, plutes and gangsters. And, uh, Raul Alacón, our friend, was happy to categorize himself as a gangster. <laughs> I don't think you would uh, describe yourself that way, but you're definitely somebody who is a capitalist, 
Uh, definitely somebody who believes in our system. Definitely somebody who believes in the power of capital when it comes to catalyzing ideas and corporations. So thank you for being here today and uh, look forward to our conversation. Is that okay? Yeah. Yep. And then you want to talk about the last piece we can insert in there. What's the big vision? So Saul, what's the big vision for Latitude at the end of the day? You know, where, where do we see this in two years or five years or even 10 years? Well, uh, first of all, I have to start with this year. Yes. You've already <laughs> talked about this year. This year is going to be more than 2x the last latitude event. That's right. We're extending the topics. We're extending the focus on the sectors. We're extending the depth of where we're going to explore some issues for Latinas in particular, but also the partnerships with other organizations where we're giving them a platform for broad access to media, coverage, etc. So each year, it's, it's this notion of the broader vision of the role that the Latino cohort plays in our economy and the kind of influence it could have and also the opportunities for businesses to make money and to capitalize 100%. off of this as, as a capitalist. And so, so I think there's the, the core essence of it is, is, is not going to change because it's based upon a view. And the view is, number one, we want you to see our family photo. Number two, there's a lot of money to be made if you can do that. And number three, we're going to facilitate how you can do deals, how you can do the kinds of connections that everybody thinks about because they don't know how to do it. They don't know where to go. They don't know who to talk to. And again, this is, f this is a canvas for all of our community that partners, and whether it's the LCDA or Alpha or the Hispanic Bar, or the Hispanic Chamber. Medical Association, the Chambers, whatever, this is everybody's platform, including the non-Latino cohort. That's, and that's right. why the sponsors, you know, continue to grow. Their, their, their canvas gets wider and also the people that we'll see on stage. So every year it's going to get more exciting. Every year it's going to get more impactful. And every year, every American should be saying, I want to be there. Because... If you go to Latitude this year, you're going to experience things. You're going to hear some things. You're going to see some people that f when you go back home and you see your friends, you're going to be saying, you should have been there. <laughs> Thanks, all.